Good morning. Uh, for me, it's not even, uh, it's, it's really early morning because I flew from uh, San Francisco this morning. I landed at uh, 8 a.m. here, just uh, rushed to the conference. So hopefully I will be a bit and not uh, get you uh, sleepy. Uh, technical content might be, well, it, it might be a little bit technical, so we'll see. And as all the topics will continue being technical, it may be good that if you have a question, then you can raise the question as you have it. Because otherwise we will be moving to many other different topics and then uh, it, it, it may be better to, to, to have all the questions at once. So I work for a company uh, called Linaro. Linaro is an organization that is profit neutral and it's uh, formed by a number of members, companies like Google, Facebook, Alibaba, Arm, Cisco, Nokia, Ericsson, Huawei, ZTE, Broadcom, TI, well, 35 members that are collaborating to, uh, to build software. To build software from the mobile handsets, the tablets, the set-top boxes, the TV systems, industrial embedded systems, servers, and also networking. So that I'm in charge of the networking department of Linaro. And as members, as I said, so uh, for the networking department, you have uh, Cisco, Nokia, Ericsson, Huawei, ZTE. And so th that's a pretty good set of uh, companies to get uh, requirements from. So I'm going to talk about uh, VPP and what ODP brings to, uh, to ODP. Uh, I worked for Six Win before joining Linaro, so I know pretty well DPDK. And I thought I knew ODP as well, because I thought it was uh, the DPDK of ARM. And actually, I was completely wrong. I, I, but I did not know at what point I was wrong. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain what I came to understand as uh, I started to work with Linaro and the guys that imagined uh, ODP. So from a software data plane perspective, uh, there are two families of software data planes. The ones that I call software implemented, which means that all the packets go through the CPU cores. So you have an input port, you have some handling, some queues, it goes to DPDK VPP and it goes to another uh, an exit port. All the flow, all the packets go through a CPU core. That's the model. So DPDK is one of such software implemented data plane. You can consider NetMap is, is another one or Windows Packet Direct can be considered also as a, a software implemented data plane. Open data plane is different. It says that at the bottom we have a pipeline or if you wish a limited graph if you compare to uh, VPP which has a very complex uh, full featured graph with loops at the heart of uh, ODP, there is a, a small pipeline of hardware blocks which can run uh, entirely autonomously to switch packets from input port to output port. So here you have a classifier, which is some kind of a generalization of RSS handling, scheduler, layer X forwarding, or maybe IPsec, or and then traffic manager for shaping at the exit. You have other, other topics. So the scheduler, scheduler role is multifold, but out of it, you can also, uh, we'll talk about a little bit of packet ordering. So the ODP API actually configures this pipeline. What are each block, what each block is doing and how they are chained. And then when it's configured, it can run, as I said, entirely autonomously. So you could build a 100 terabit switch and control it through ODP API with an, a single ARM core, which would be just doing the programmation of the hardware. 
So you could think of ODP as a combination of DPDK and switch dev, for example, in a, in a, single, in a single product. Now you can also decide to extract traffic from any of those hardware blocks or functional blocks in, in the pipeline and direct it to an ARM core. So you have, in that case, it's more, it's closer to a DPDK mode of, of behavior. You can do that for all traffic, you can do that for a selected set of traffic, and you can do it uh, at different exit points of the graph. So you could think of the ODP application of some kind of customized node of the ODP graph. So you might say, okay, that's uh, different, but what does it buy me? So I'm, I can't be very precise on the figures because they are not public yet, but to do a 20 gig IPsec uh, node, you know, for SD1 you have, let's assume that you have an SD1 box sitting at a branch office, you want 10 gigabit uplink and downlink, and you want the box to cost the least amount uh, possible. So f we did a measurement with uh, an ARM system with one core. The cost of the system, public price, the box. I mean, not, not, the, not the entire box, but the motherboard plus the CPU plus, well, uh, without the optics, without the SFPs, around $100. And you have 20 gigabit of iMix throughput that can be done in IPsec. You could have, so that's iMix, that's not just large packets. If you push the packet size to 64 bytes, then the throughput uplink downlink is 11 gigabit per second for $100 the box. If you do that with another <laughs> uh, microprocessor, still SOC with, uh, with, uh, with ports, you have to have between a four and eight cores, more probably eight, or even, well, eight to do at least 20 gig of large packets, not iMix, and the cost will be between $1,000 and $2,000, the system. So here I would say there might be technical philosophies that are different, but bottom line, that's the bottom line <laughs> which is important. And if you take the, um, the other microprocessor vendor with the PDK, so that's the cost I've said, but if you do that with ODP and, uh, and how we will handle the, uh, the existing acceleration, you will be able to get a lower processor and you know, the, the, the processor pricing is not linear. So if you go to four cores, it's not half the price, it's more than half the price. So here, what I say is that on the same hardware, on uh, not an ARM system, with uh, ODP by using this pipelining uh, of, of hardware function, you can really use the hardware as much as possible. So that's the fundamental difference. I did not understood while I was doing DPDK, so I really thought ODP was a DPDK on ARM, and that's definitely not the case. What are the other differences? Uh, well, the programming model is a little bit different. It is uh, event-based. Well, it's not because it is event-based that it cannot do run to completion, but it, you, when you create very large applications, not a layer three forwarding application, but you know, as we have uh, uh, large network equipment providers, when they build products, you have a team of uh, 50 people that build one module, you have a team of 50 people that build one module, and then you have other teams that build products out of those modules, and the, the team that have wor worked on 
independent modules have worked really independently. So ultimately, when they assemble those modules and they fit together to build a product, a cloud-run system or a PE router or something else, they assemble modules, so they need an extremely fast event framework behind it. So that's almost the same idea of VPP with the modules, but at the, uh, with the uh, plugins, but at the application uh, module level. One thing for IPsec is the fat pipe. So you can reach a uh, high performance on IPsec. Essentially, when you have a number of tunnels, usually a few hundred tunnels, then the, the figures you see in the benchmarks show the performance with large packets, with large uh, number of tunnels. But when you have real situation, you usually have only one tunnel from let's say the SD1 endpoint to the uh, aggregation layer. And you would like to have that single tunnel to reach 10 gig, but to be able to do that, you have to take into account packet ordering. And packet ordering is also part of uh, the ODP framework. It's part of the framework in, in, in the sense that it's either done in hardware by one functional block part of the pipeline, or we have also a software implementation for systems that do not provide a packet ordering pipeline. The packet ordering pipeline is also uh, is one of the things that is necessary because when you have packets coming in from one tunnel, if you have RSS, they will all go to one queue. So if you have a DPDK programming model, you will have to implement an internal queue management to actually dispatch the packets to different cores, but you will have to build that infrastructure by hand. In ODP, this is part of the ODP framework, so the application does not have to do it. So that, that's the essential differences. But one thing which is important for me is that who would build actually an application on DPDK and ODP today? I guess the, the best approach to developing application is better to use VPP and create a plugin rather than do everything uh, alone. Or to use Open FastPath as a socket API for uh, application servers, for example. But you have, you have to understand the low level details uh, of each data plane uh, uh, library but you should not maybe consider developing directly on those applications, rather developing on VPP or OFP. I will dig a little bit more on, uh, on the differences and what happens when you reach 50 gig or even 25 and above. Let's take 50 gig because 50 gig seems to be the the most uh, liked um, connectivity for uh, network equipment vendors in the, in the telco industry. Uh, if you look at uh, Facebook, they also use a 100 gig. So 50 gig is uh, 74 million packets per second. 74 million packets per second, that's huge. But there is a, a catch and uh, it was it was not mentioned earlier by the Intel people for the PCI aspect, but there is a limitation on the PCI bus, which can conclude 36 million DMA transactions per second. So if you have 36 million DMA transactions on one hand and 74 million packets per second on the other hand, there's a problem. You can dance whatever dance you can, it, the packet won't go through unless you switch more than one packet per DMA transaction. But if you stitch more than one packet per DMA transaction, this means that the software does not control where the hardware plays the packet. 
The hardware decides where it puts the packet because it has a DMA engine policy. And when you talk to Xilinx and other guys that, that work at 400 gig, uh, you know, for the design phase of 400 gig adapters, the key element is the DMA engine. How do we push those packets through whatever interconnect to the CPU cores? So what, what's the catch here when I say it's the hardware that decides where the packet push places the packet? Where with the PDK, the software decides where the packet are. The software lists a set of buffers and informs the hardware, please put the packets in those places which are typically 2K aligned. So if you have 2K aligned packet buffers, the hardware cannot coalesce multiple packets into one DMA transaction to fit into the model. So by construction, you cannot do line rate on a single 50 gig port or 100 gig port on a, on a, on a model on a data plane that don't let the hardware decide where it puts the packets. So you can have, you can trick the system. So there is a one, um, a company called Netcope has a 100 gig uh, card based on Xilinx, and it has a PMD for that. But the PMD actually deals with the uh, native packets internally in internal buffers. And as the buffers are received, or the packets are received on those proprietary buffers in a sequential manner, they are then copied into the PDK buffers, and conversely for the exit point. So this means that you have incoming 100 gig, which is roughly uh, uh, 15 gigabytes per second of, of data that goes to RAM, you, you copy it, then it's uh, an additional uh, loose of layer three cache. And then as you're using the memory resources, you can't build an application. So the application that is demonstrated at 100 gig to switch packets from one port to the other is really a switching, uh, a port switching application. I get the packet from port A, I send it to B, and from B to A. I don't look at the header, I don't do any routing table, I, I don't do anything else. But you can't do anything else because the memory subsystem is entirely clogged by the memory copies. So we hope to, let's say, to unleash those 50 gig and 100, 100 gig interfaces when uh, uh, we'll have the drivers for uh, ODP natively. And ODP is, by the way, not just ARM, but also x86. This is a, a mandatory point from our members that ODP has to run at full speed on x86 also. So if you go to the Open Data Plane website, you will find multiple implementations of ODP. There is one which is uh, Linux generic, which is a reference implementation. And you have a number of uh, vendor-specific uh, implementation, one for KVM, one for TI, one for NXP, et cetera. We, we are in the process of building another one which we call ODP Cloud, which in, in, in the spirit of ODP Cloud is to be able to work on any uh, silicon, uh, silicon specific, ARM silicon specific uh, uh, architectures with a various set of accel hardware accelerations and have a, a unified Git repo. But for the moment, it looks like they are forked projects from ODP. That's not the case, but from an, uh, let's say, organization perspective, we would like the project to look more uh, DPDK, where you have one binary that can handle all the hardware. So that's where we, that's where we want to go with ODP Cloud.
uh, by the way, yeah, uh, one, one thing, uh, ODP can be implemented in, in, in strange environments. So uh, we have one uh, company, Calray, who, who has some sort of GPU without any operating system in it, which has a specific memory model for the cores where the cores have private memory and ha can access some shared memory, much like the GPUs can have the texture memory and then local memory. Local memory cannot be accessed from another core. So technically speaking, they cannot implement DPDK on their, on their hardware because the memory model the, is not able to cope with that. But with ODP, you can accommodate any kind of execution environment. So that was uh, ODP uh, and DPDK. Both are very good solutions. They may serve different needs for different markets. So hopefully you haven't understood that I consider ODP as being better than DPDK. They are different. They serve different needs. In some cases, it has some business value of choosing one versus the other, not from a technical perspective. Now, how VPP and ODP fit together? Well, quite naturally, as I said, that v uh, ODP is at, at its very heart some kind of limited graph. So, in the previous presentation, you had an IPsec presentation, uh, 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 let's say a graph of how IPsec was done in VPP by adding nodes. Well, those nodes could be in the ODP graph, in the hardware. So you have the VPP configuration for IPsec. The uh, ODP input, which is the equivalent of DPDK input in the VPP graph, can either push packets in the normal Ether input, so the e layer two uh, input, or because it has done the whole IPsec thing, directly push the, the packets to the IP4 input node or IP6 input node of the VPP graph. So rather than going through all the different steps of IPsec, you can establish some, some shortcuts in the VPP graph because they have been offloaded in the ODP pipeline. So that's why the, the, there is a, a very natural fit between VPP and ODP. VPP has an event model program, programming, ODP also, so this is kind of very simple. So we have created an, a project in FIDO called ODP for VPP, where we open source all the, let's say, the, this uh, input node so that you can leverage the ODP uh, that will be available on the distribution. Now, where would you put VPP with ODP? If I, I want, let's say that you can place VPP ODP in a host. That's the typical uh, placement. You can also entirely offload it to a smart NIC. So there is no VPP in the host. The VPP instance is in the smart NIC. The honeycomb agent is either in the host or on the smart NIC. For the Calray, for example, the, the honeycomb agent cannot fit in the GPU. So the honeycomb agent will, will be in the host controlling the VPP uh, in the smart NIC. For KVM, Oction, TX, smart NIC, which, uh, which, which can have a, a, an entire Linux inside, so the, um, uh, the honeycomb agent will be local to the smart NIC. But you can also deploy on both the host and the smart NIC, and that's probably the best deployment option. And one reason is the east-west traffic between VMs. 
If you do traffic, if you do have the traffic from one VM to the other go through the PCI bus, you basically you cannot do a 40 gig service chain on the system because the PCI slot has a 50 gig uplink and downlink limit. So if you go from VM A to VM B, you go down, so that's uh, 40 gig, I was mentioning a 40 gig, uh, so 40 gig one, 40 gig upstream, so that's okay. Now we want to go from VM B to VM C, you have to go 40 gig down again on the same PCI slot. Too bad you already had consumed, you're already consuming 40 gig from VM A to VM B, so you cannot do that. So you cannot build a 40 gig service chain with an embedded switch on, hosted on the SmartNIC. So that's why if you deploy VPP on the host and on the SmartNIC, they can both collaborate to make sure that uh, for east-west traffic, the host VPP can do the east-west traffic and the SmartNIC helps on the IPsec termination or routing. If you have a, a very large uh, internet, if you have the whole internet routing table on the, on the to handle that's about eight gigabytes of memory and 600,000 routes. Some network operators in the world uh, push that type of uh, uh, routing table at the very edge of the, of the network so that subscribers, when they reach aggregation, the very first level of aggregation, they know how to exit the network to the best exit point for they are the de destination. If they go to Asia, they will follow a proper route. If they go to US or YouTube or Netflix, they will immediately take the, the best route. So having the offloading that to the SmartNIC may be very beneficial. Uh, so that's... Uh, <clears throat> first part of my talk, which is what we are currently uh, doing. We'll have demos in September on uh, VPP, ODP, uh, demos with uh, performance. We expect to show uh, 50 gig uh, line rate, 50, 64 byte packets with uh, one solution. And also uh, demonstrate the very opposite, which is VPP on a on a, on a nail size chip uh, with a few bucks to, to, build, uh, to build a very uh, low cost gateways for the home. So it's not because you can do uh, 200 gig uh, switching that you cannot do also efficiently uh, one gig switching. We are trying to push things in the PDK so that they realize the good thing that has to be done to make sure that um, there is some convergence. So members are pushing the event model, members are pushing things. Uh, 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 sorry, I did not hear the event, you. The, the event was one of the key, er, when, when we had this one meeting, that's, or three meetings that started this convergence or this discussion, one of the things that were identified was the whole event, uh, uh, the whole event right. driven, right, mechanism. And so my question is, is now two years, I think, uh, I think. <laughs> so ha is, are we, Almost done, or we're still it, talking it's about it? It's getting there, it's getting there, but the, the, the biggest hurdle I see for the moment is what I just talked about, the, the buffer management. If, if the very root of DPDK, it is that DPDK tells the hardware what to do, and when you reach 50 gig and above line rate, you can't do that. So there is a yeah. fundamental shift to be done. It's technically feasible, but it will require some work and some will to do it. 
And so, okay, so this has always been my question. Is it a technical problem or is it a, a willing problem? And you're saying it's not a technical problem, it's really a willing problem to... Yeah, well, it becomes a technical problem because it changes a little bit the application structure because the application today, the typical DPDK application is I create a memory pool and I tell Mr. Driver, put the packets here. The model has to be changed and the application has to say, okay, get me some packets and the, the driver will, will tell where it has put, in which pool it has yep, put yep. the packets. So this is not a... Well, can it be, I mean, I know I'm simplifying, can it be some sort of off, off on switch that says use it or not use it? You know, you, you use the DVDK which ends up deciding where it goes or don't use it and just pass yeah, it yeah, through yeah. and let something else do it? If I, well, I will re respond to your question differently. Yeah. If there is a will, there is a possibility of convergence. Okay. That's the, there is no hard technical hurdle that would prevent addressing okay. all the issues. Okay, so those are the two areas, basically the event-driven model and then the, uh, the data packet. Um, yeah, the, the hardware-driven hardware hardware -driven driven. path, not software-driven. Okay, you Intel guys were here, you heard that. <laughs> we are already done. Ha <laughs> ha. Was it 10.40, So he, that's the plan, what, what we are going to do. Very briefly on the vision side, what are the things brewing? One is what we call direct vertio, so I will skip those things. What's, what's the idea? The idea is to have the smart NICs talk directly to the VMs using vertio so that there is no uh, driver dependency or hardware dependency. So it looks good. Uh, NXP and Xilinx have done some proof of concepts and too bad there is something that does not work. That's how you handle the available and used uh, descriptors. So a good thing about Etsy <laughs> is that they have an idea of uh, leveraging the Vertio but extending the Vertio with some plugins and some additional things. And one idea is to actually complement the Vertio model with a specific direct Vertio a uh, virtual function which becomes a hardware function and then you can use that control function in the VM to make sure that the packet management, the buffer management can be fully controlled by the hardware without involvement from the host and without the tricky uh, cache line or the DMA uh, problem of handling the, uh, the available and used uh, buffer chains. Uh, there is also another way to uh, uh, address the problem and it will be in the ARM ecosystem where there is a, a new interconnect called C6. C6 is a coherent interconnect between I.O. and processor. So this means that they, uh, the processor and the I.O. can share cache lines. So in that case, there is no distinction if the memory is controlled by the processor or controlled by the I.O. So Vertio will be in this, in this case fully uh, uh, um, offloadable to the hardware. So the hardware will be able to talk native Vertio at full speed. So it's the benefit of SREOV in terms of latency with the benefit of live migration and, and, and hardware independence of Vertio. Bottom line, if I would suggest uh, SREOV is not mandatory to be high performance. And another proof point, another let's say measure, um, on a uh, Vertio VM I generated on 1Q 142 gigabit of traffic. So Vertio is not the, the performance, that's the back end, which is, if it's OVS, it's a very slow but that the Vertio by itself is not slow. That's the back end. So ODPNet is something else. 
Again, we recognize the benefit of single driver, hardware agnostic driver for VMs, like Vertio. So Vertio allows to be completely hardware independent. The idea is to leverage very complex offloads from VMs using a single uh, abstract PCI device, which will be controlled by a single device driver, regardless of if, if the SmartNIC comes from KVM, uh, NXP, uh, Mellanox, Marvel, or others. Last point. If you go to systems that, are, that have 400 cores and you have SmartNICs, it starts to look like the GPU world where you have uh, applications that may be split between the host and, and the SmartNIC. So you have OpenCL to have your part of your application run on the host, part of your application run on the GPU, and in a hardware independent way because that's hidden behind OpenCL. Well, why not doing that also for networking and have ODPCL, which will allow you to create application leveraging concepts of OpenCL, and parts of the parallel aspects will be offloaded to the SmartNIC. The SmartNIC being either a real SmartNIC or an FPGA. And I've uh, just uh, last week started to talk to FPGA vendors if they like to collaborate on Vertio FPGA and well, there, it, it might be possible. Well, thank you for your uh, attention. If you have any question. Uh, I did not he hear very well your question. So the, um, there is a software implementation of the event dev model in DPDK, and KVM is just upstreaming also for the next DPDK release yeah. a hardware implementation. So that's that's available. It's, it's 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 moving forward. And Intel and KVM have collaborated to make a uh, an event model that can fit both hardware yeah, it was uh, just, environments. You know, we were talking about it. Uh, yeah. So that's the status at the moment. Yeah. Then the, the problem is the data path with the um, hardware-driven buffer management. Well, you have the other, uh, the packet ordering framework. I'm not sure it's there, but if you want to have fat pipes for your customers, you have to have a packet ordering framework. So, so. And if you look at, for example, IPsec acceleration today, um, as we have the pipeline model, we can have inline IPsec acceleration. While with DPDK, for the moment, you cannot do you can do only look aside acceleration, which costs a lot because you have packet movements always from the network card to the software back to the accelerator. That so all those PCI movements cost not only latency, but if, if you have two, one TCP session that goes from A to B, the latency result in a TCP window no, do not open, and even though the DPDK IPsec acceleration could handle more traffic, the endpoint, because of the latency, do not open the window and have at least half of the bandwidth or half of the throughput they could handle. Yeah, I had a question about the IPsec numbers you mentioned earlier, the 20 gigs. Um, can you talk about what kind of encryption was utilized for that? 
Oh, it was uh, the typical uh, AES 256 with uh, CAB, uh, CBC, I don't remember. No, is it CBC? I don't remember the, uh, but the typical one. <laughs> I mean, I mean, a real, a real encryption, not null, uh, <laughs> null algorithm, both on the uh, crypto and hashing algorithm. Do we have, uh, I think we have time for one more question. And then uh, if anyone has any direct questions, if you don't mind, we have the break. So, Thank you very much. Ask. Thank you, Francois.